So, hello everyone. My name's David Day. I'm going to talk to you today about Maplets, which is a very exciting thing we've got working in Google Maps at the moment. Maplets are about a year old at the moment, and there's still a lot of work happening with them, a lot of new exciting Maplet uses we see every day. So I thought I first would start with showing you what a Maplet is from a user's perspective and why they're so powerful and useful for users. So I'm sure you're all familiar with mashups, where people take a Google Map and they get content from other sources and put it all on a web page so that users can interact geographically with information that's already there. So for example, this mashup we can use to get information from Craigslist about houses for rent or for sale. So if you're looking for a house, this is a great way to quickly find things for rent. You can see where they are. If you're not from the area, it's really quick and easy to visualize where things are. It all uses Google Maps and the Maps API to help give a great visualization. But if you're not from the area or you'd like to learn more, this by itself isn't everything you need because maybe you want to know where are the best schools or where's the public transport am I close to, and say, a rail network, what's the crime like in this area. So you'd end up going from site to site trying to get all this information, compiling it in your head. Some of them might not be in maps or it's very hard to find a map of that information. So if you're not familiar with the area, it's really hard to get a feel for how it all fits together. So this is where maplets can fit in to that picture. So say, for example, I was looking to, to rent something in Chicago. Under the My Maps tab here, there's a whole heap of maplets which I found in the directory which I think could probably help me find in this place to live. So a good place to start is, of course, real estate search. And here we have a maplet Google real estate search which will help me find what's for rent and say between $1,000 and $2,000 in this local area. And here you can see the information I've put in is interacting with the map through this maplet so that I've actually got extra content on my map. So I still actually don't really know very much about Chicago, since I'm not from the area, obviously. So how do I, how do I then narrow down which of these is actually a useful, a useful house for me to live in, which is going to be good for me? We can get the power of maplets is you can have more than one thing at once, all on the same map. So I can get the Chicago transit map, and it shows me where all the lines are from the train line, sorry. So straight away you think, oh, well, number 18 here, it looks like it's right in the center of things. It's $2,000, it's in my, it's in my um, price range, and it's got great transport. Then again, maybe I'm more concerned about crime because I want to feel safe. And I'm, again, I'm not familiar with the area. So something like spot crime here can actually bring up what are the recent crimes in the area so that I can actually see, am I in an area which is sort of a hot spot for crime or am I more in a safe area? There's even um, this maplet which has all the bureau statistics. Sorry, it sent me all the way back across the map. But I might be interested, for example, in trying to find somewhere where people of my own age were living, so somewhere in their mid-twenties. And this can show me, you know, what's the population density of this? Or maybe I'm looking, am I, do I want to live somewhere where there's lots of rentals or lots of owners? And again, this sort of map can show me that in the middle here there's lots of rentals and more owners in the outside. Another good thing about maplets is they can really change the way people perceive maps. So, an example of this is the 2008 US primaries maplet, which using the maplet is able to quickly convey on Google Maps a lot of information and give people a really good understanding of how the US elections are going on. So you can see we're using color, different size markers. There's um, poly polygons in the background to help outline the states. So you can see. For example, how the Democratic, who's, who's in front, and also how, big's that, how big is that area. So what exactly is a maplet? 
A maplet is actually a mashup of two different Google technologies. The first of these is a Google Gadget. So Google Gadgets you might be familiar with mostly from places like the iGoogle homepage where people can put gadgets on their homepage to customize it to what they need. For example, there's Gmail or Reader or a whole heap of gadgets. A gadget is basically just a normal web page with HTML and JavaScript running in an iframe within a page. So usually that's on iGoogle, but it can be syndicated onto anyone's website. Um, Google Gadgets actually have some very powerful features built right into them. So you can, for example, get access to remote data that you wouldn't usually be able to get to through the Google caches. Or you can store user preferences and have a, a way that people can customize their gadgets with very little extra work. The other half of the pair is the Google Maps API. So the Maps API is what you see in the regular mashup. It's got the JavaScript wrappers around the normal Google Maps so you can take complete control of the map. For example, adding markers, listening to user events. You can um, you know, populate it with information and also listen to what information the user is giving back to you. So when you add those two things together, that's what gives you a gadget. So gadgets are actually XML files. With a, with, um, they're very simple in nature. There's three basic parts. First of all, you have your XML wrapper, which is the module. The second part is the module preferences, which tells the gadget what, what things it needs and also a little bit about itself. So for example, this is a little gadget called Hello World. It tells you about the author and it describes it for you. And the last thing, which is actually where the power of the gadget is, where the workhorse of the gadget is coming from, is the content. So here, we have embedded straight into the gadget HTML, which would say, hello world, this is my first gadget. So taking this and actually turning it into a maplet is a very, very easy thing to do. To harness the power of the maps part, that the API, all we need to add is this extra part in the preferences require feature shared map. And that basically loads in all the JavaScript that we're going to need to interact with the map. And then instead of having just HTML content inside the gadget, we can actually start interacting with the map. So here we, have, we centered the map on Sydney and we zoomed out to a level of four. So this is a good time to show you some of the tools that you actually can use while you're creating maplets. So I'll just unload what we had. The first one that is really useful when you're just up and running and trying to get your head around maplets is the maplet scratch pad. And basically, we have a little text box over here to the side, which you can enter the full gadget spec like we just saw, and it will let us preview that straight on the map without having to go back and forth between an editor. So for example, I can quickly load the Hello World, which is always a great starting point for maplets, because it, it, then you don't have to worry about all the syntax of the module preferences. You just start from this. And by clicking Preview, straight away we can see Hello World. Another really useful one is the developer maplet which by itself doesn't do much. But you'll find as you start using these gadgets, it, um, it helps you keep refreshing them to make sure that you're always looking at the latest version of your maplet in the page. But I'll get to that in a bit. The last one, which I find really useful, is the API reference maplet, which actually just lists a whole heap of things that you can do on the map and makes them, makes them into links so you can see straight away how that interacts with the map. For example, if I wanted to turn this into a satellite map, this shows me how I would do it. And by clicking it, you can see how it works. So you can actually find all these maplets in the maplet directory. If you, just, if you browse the directory, then the three of them are there. And I would really strongly suggest you add them if you're starting working on maplets because they're really handy to get you up and running quickly. So before you can actually start developing maplets, it's really important that you know how they function, because how they function, how they're actually operating in your browser, 
does dictate how you're going to write them. It makes a big impact. So at a high level, your gadget as the user running in the user's browser is interacting with two different servers. It's interacting with maps.google.com, which is giving the user access to all their general mapping information. So it loads all the maps JavaScript. It helps them geocode things. But it also works with maps.gmodules.com, which is where the gadgets are coming from. So gmodules.com actually acts as a gateway between your site, where you're storing your maplet, and between the user's preferences. So gmodules.com actually looks after everything that makes this a gadget, more or less. So it, used the, it used, is used to fetch the gadget spec, and it's used to look after the user's preferences. In the actual browser, this it becomes quite a complication because you have the main page running on maps.google.com, but your gadget is running in an iframe, which is running on maps.gmodules.com. And as many of you are probably aware, you, are, you can't get JavaScript to talk to between two different domains within the browser because of the security policy. So to get around this, what we need to do is create a smaller iframe in the maps.google.com domain inside your gadget iframe. And that little iframe is used to allow communication backwards and forwards between the main map and your gadget. So because the channel is only through this iframe, and the, this works by we add a hash component to the URL of the iframe, and then the outside map can actually monitor that and see when we add a new hash. So it's able to actually send strings backwards and forwards between the, map, the module, which is the maplet, and the maps itself. Because we're only getting strings backwards and forwards, all function calls to and from the map need to be serialized and packeted so that they can be sent in string form. The big thing with this is that the channel is actually asynchronous. Because when you make a function call in your JavaScript inside your maplet, what it needs to do is create that, packet it up into a string, and put it in that iframe. And then at a later date, when the maps realizes that it has changed, that's when that function will be executed. So you can't actually um, rely on things happening straight away. Everything is asynchronous. So that's one of the biggest hurdles people changing from normal maps API to maplets face is this that everything that you everything that you do to the map happens asynchronously so for example in the maps API you might say map dot get center and that will straight away return to you the point at the middle of the map in maplets what you need to do instead is get center async and pass in a callback so in this case, what we have is a function which takes the center. And when, sorry, when, the, um, when that communication is sent to the map and comes back, then our callback will be invoked. So these two things basically do the same thing. But in one, we need to wrap it in a callback so that we can cope with the fact that all this communication is acting asynchronously. The, the good thing about this is every time that you're going to have to worry about this asynchronous nature, we've appended the suffix async to the end. So if you are familiar with the Google Maps API already, coming to maplets isn't such a headache because everything is going to be labeled async. So you know when you need to think differently. OK. So the first thing that people want to do when they start writing a map is actually start putting things on the map. So everything that you can add to the map that goes on top of the tiles is known as an overlay. So whether that's your markers or your info windows, your polylines, your polygons, they're all known as overlays. And you, all, you add them all the same way. So in this case, we have, um, we first of all have the asynchronous callback to ask the map, where is the current middle of the map. Then we have options, such as options when we're making a marker. So we might specify a title. We can specify whether it's draggable, bouncy. We can make our own icons. We create the marker, and then we add the overlay. So you can see that the names that we use 
are very self-descriptive. So, G marker, G polygon, G polyline. So I thought rather than actually um, just doing these simple little examples each time, it might be more interesting if we started using these things to build up a fuller idea of what a maplet is by building a little application. So here's the start of a maplet, which is called Where on Earth. So if you're familiar with where in the world is Carmen San Diego, this is going to be kind of familiar to you. Basically, we've got to help track down Sergey on the map, one of the Google founders, and Larry's, we're helping Larry find him with a series of cryptic clues. Here are our clues, so don't look, at, I'm giving away. But um, so you can see we've just got the title, some clues, and a GLAT long. So that's just sort of data for our, our maplet. And this is just going to make a very simple, simple beginning. So here's where we're initially setting up the map. You can see we're creating a lat long for mountain view. So the latitude and the longitude of mountain view. We're setting the map center, the map, the map type, and the map zoom. We could also have done this all in the one section. So if we extend this a little bit further, adding, um, for example, if we want to open up an info window to tell people the first clue of how to find Larry, I mean, it's okay, sorry. It's actually really simple. So the first thing we can do is just create the HTML that we want to appear inside the info window. So and then from the game, obviously this is just a quick, simple prototype. So. Later on, we might want to randomize it and make it more interesting, but let's just see how this goes. And hopefully, fingers crossed, I haven't spelled anything wrong. That's all it will take to get, oh, sorry. We need to say where it is as well as, so where are we opening the info window and what do we want to put in it? So there we go. Sergey has left the clue. Sergey is visiting the Mona Lisa. So straight away, we can start to, you can see how quick and easily from those two little lines of JavaScript, we added new content to the map. We can even go further and start adding um, markers and more information. Oh no. Not one. So here, for example, we're making our own custom marker with Sergey smiling face in it. So you first we start off by making an icon class and we're basing that on the G default icon, which is sort of the um, boiler template that you use. You always, it's often easier to start off with the default icon and then just change the things you need to. So in the second bit, Sergey icon dot image, I'm just changing what image I'm going to use for the marker. Otherwise, it defaults to the color um, of your maplet, like just a plain old Google marker. So it's often good, strongly encouraged to customize that so your users get some useful visual feedback when they're looking at the map, what they're seeing. Then. I create some marker options, so I say, so to, I say that you want to use this icon, and you'd like to use this title. We create a G marker, and then finally we add the overlay to the map. So if we see this in action, now because this has actually been left on the first clue, we'll find it all the way over in Paris, and there we go. Sergey's shining face. So it's that easy to start adding your own information and your own custom, customized and interesting information onto the Google Maps. Where am I? Okay. 
working with maps is obviously a two-way stream. So not only do we want to listen, I mean, sorry, insert content onto the map, we also need to constantly be listening to the user to see what they're doing. Otherwise, it's not going to be quite as interesting and interactive for the user. If they can do things on the map and see them change on your maplet and get feedback, that's when it starts to get really interesting for the user. So actually adding events to the map is really easy because of what we've got is the geoevent namespace, which sort of wraps all the event listening that you're ever going to need. So for example, here is a quick little function that we, get, we want to run whenever somebody clicks on the map. So the function click needs two parameters. It either takes the mark, it, it has a marker and a point as its parameter. So if when the user clicked on the map, they clicked on a marker, that marker will be returned to us. If instead they just clicked in empty space, then the point will be returned. So all this function does is see, checks, did the user click on a marker? If so, let's get rid of it. Otherwise, let's add a new marker. So basically, it's sort of a toggle on, toggle off for markers. And then the magic which actually adds that to the map is as simple as this one line, geevent.addListener map. So we're adding it to the map object. Click, so the click, and then click function. So if we wanted to extend our game a bit more so that the user got some visual feedback when they actually had actually found Sergey, again, this is only a few little lines of code. So now here I've got a new function, check location. And inside that, I actually want to find out where the user is currently looking at the map. So I have maps.getbound async. Again, getting any information from the map is going to be an asynchronous process. So this is going to give me back a bounds object. So I check. If Sergey's marker is actually on the web page, on the, the map, and also that it's contained within the current viewport, then we just open up a little Winfo window saying, well done. And then, again, the magic glue, which adds it, actually makes us listen to the map as easy as map on the event move end. So once the map is finished moving, whether it be zoomed or panned, use this function check location. So it all looks the same so far, because obviously we haven't found Sergey. But if we scroll across, maybe not so good at scrolling. Then once he comes into the viewport, well done. We've found him. All right. So the other really interesting part of Maplets is that they can sit behind and keep working um, even when the user isn't actively looking at the maplet. So let's just preview this again, but find him a little more quickly this time. So we know straight away, well, hopefully we know straight away by now that he's hiding in Paris. So if, as the user, I just search for Paris, you see that the maplet is still running, even though we're no longer seeing it visually in that left pane, it's still actually able to listen to the, the map's events and respond to them. So if you have a maplet which needs to constantly update information depending on where the user's looking at, then you can do that without having to worry that the user might not be looking at your maplet at the particular time. So, you can see that it could quickly become really tedious using these asynchronous events. You ask the map for something, it gives you a back later, so you've got a function callback there that you've wrapped it around. Then you need to ask for something else based on that, or in parallel to that, so you have another callback. So there's a bit of syntactic sugar which is built into the maplets called gasync. And basically that lets you take any number of things that need to be running at the same time 
and put them all into one function call so they all come back to you at one time in one callback. So here's an example where someone already has set up a marker and a polyline on the map, and now they need to interrogate them to get information about them. So they want to know what's the current zoom, what's the current bounds of the map, where is the marker actually located, and they want to get one of the points on the map, on the polyline. So this, down the bottom, geosync actually lets us make all those calls in one and get them back as a single value. So the syntax of this function can be a little bit confusing at first. If you have an object, if you're passing in an object, then that's the thing that you're trying to operate on. So for example, we're passing in the map object, and we're calling get zoom and get bounds on them. So when we have a string, that's referring to calling that method on the object preceding it. So you can see map, get zoom, and get bounds, they all belong together. So we're first of all going to call get zoom level, and then we're going to call get bounds. Then we have another object marker, get point. So it knows that that get point function is referring to the marker object. And finally, if you actually need to pass in parameters, then you pass those in within an array object. So polyline get vertex actually takes which um, asks for which index of the vertex you want. So here we've asked for the third vertex. And even though we're only passing in one parameter, we still wrap it in an array so that geosync knows what to, what, that it's expecting parameters as in that area. And then finally, we give it the callback. So when this runs, you'll get all that information back in one time. OK. The last thing that's really important is actually getting information into your maplet from an external provider. So for example, you might need to get information from your server if the user's making requests. For example, we often have um, maplets which do searches on their own data and put them on the Google map, like, for example, fuel pricing. Because you're actually running in maps.gmodules.com, you can't instantly get out to the domain of your own. So there's some very nice wrapper functions, such as IG fetch content and IG fetch XML content, which let you specify the URL and also give a callback so when that information comes back, you can get it. The really good thing about these is that not only does it actually allow you to access data from your own server, but it also lets you have that cached. So if you need to, you can, um, sorry, it reduces the load on your, your server because instead of having 10,000, 100,000, a million, hopefully, users using your maplet every day, and you get in every single one of those people hitting your own server, which might not be you know, it might be just running in your own home or it might be a small one that you haven't got set up to cope with that load. iGoogle will hit your server maybe once every couple of hours and be able to continually serve that content up to users. So it's good for you because you have less server load and it's good for users because there's one less step when they have to fetch the content and it's much quicker for them. You can actually specify as a third parameter how often you need that, where you would like that refreshed. By default, it's every two to four hours. But say you've got some dynamic data that you need to have constantly been updated, then you might say 60 seconds or five seconds, whatever you're willing to cope with. So you notice that initially we had clues hard-coded into our maplet. A better way to go might actually be to set up just some quick little XML, which um, instead of having having it hard-coded in our code, we can quickly change. Maybe the server dynamically generates this based on how, how well the user's going. So nice and easy. To actually get this into the map, again, it's not a huge issue. The, the hardest part about it is actually processing the data once we get it. It's not. So now, instead of having to have the game all preloaded, we give it the URL where we're going to store our clues. And then we process 
the XML content in it just the same way we would have processed, say, a DOM document. So it's very easy. And that's all there is to it, really. Just using this IG fetch XML content, providing the URL and the callback. The other thing that you might want to do and consider is even if you don't want to get external data that you need to process with your JavaScript, you still might be using external resources such as icons or style sheets, external JavaScript, and you still don't want every single user coming through to hit your server. So to get around this, there's another two nice little functions. First of all is IG get image, which will go to your server, fetch that image, and return it to the JavaScript as an image object. So you can quickly append that into your DOM or use it as you need to. And again, that's all cached. doesn't hit your server every time. Or if you actually need to use a URL, um, for example, you might want to set that inside a style sheet, or you might need to create a script tag which contains that URL. Then this function at the bottom, all it does is take a URL that in your own domain and returns to you the URL which can, you can use to fetch that from in the uh, from the Google caches. So, for people running in um, running their own mashups, the difference between maplets and maps are generally not that huge, but there are some very important ones. The biggest one we've been over already, it's that everything in the Maps API is synchronous and you can do it straight away, whereas in Maplets it's asynchronous, so you need to always be providing callbacks so that you can actually get information from the map. Another important one is that Maplets can't actually change the behavior of maps to any extreme measure. So in the Maps API, you can do whatever you want to the map pretty much. Um, there's examples of people using it to display magazine pages or you can actually change the standard behavior where, so people might not be able to double click to zoom. Things that users on Google Maps, on the actual Google Maps page will find very confusing because they've added your gadget, but all of a sudden the way the entire page works is, is not the same. So for example, you can't stop people from panning or zooming, you can't lock them into a viewport, and you can't make your own controls that you place on the map. Another important one is that anything you put in info windows is going to be sanitized. That's because the info window is actually on the maps.google.com domain. So you can't just put your own content on there without, without us trying to sanitize it first. Because otherwise, um, what goes in that info window could actually upset the operation of the rest of the map. Say if there was some malicious script tags or some unended div tags, you know, something crazy, then the actual map itself would stop operating. So we have to be very careful that the user's information is protected and the way that maps operate it is protected. A good thing um, in Maplet's favor is that they're much easier to initialize. So in all our examples, to get the handle to the map, it was as simple as creating a new gmap2 object and then we're ready to go. Whereas in the API, you need to worry about getting the key to make sure it operates properly. You need to download the script and work out which version of the script you're happy to run with. This is actually a much simpler and easier way to go. So the other sort of content that developers can get onto Google Maps is KML and GORSS. So Maplets are part of this family of getting content out to users from developers. The big difference is that KML is really suited to static or slowly changing content in and large data sets. So for example, if you have a whole list of points that you need to get on the map and they're never going to change, then KML is the way to go. You just list all those points as an, in an XML format and you get them out there. It's great for that sort of data which you can share with the world. And the other good thing about KML is that it will run across a lot of different products. For example, it will also work in Google Earth. Maplets, on the other hand, allow completely interactive applications. So they're probably a little harder to get going at first, but once you get there, they've got much more power. You can get custom UIs, get people interacting with them much, in much more complex ways. So. Once you've made your maplet, how do you actually get it out to the real world? How do you get people using it? So 
the first thing you need to do if you want people to be able to discover your maplet is get it into the maplet directory. So I was showing you that before when we had the, when I was showing you the developer tools, but this is the developer, the, sorry, the, this is where all the maplets can be found and users can search for them. So you really want your maplet in here so that when people have a maplet for a specific purpose or they, they're after a tool for a specific purpose, they can quickly find it. And this is how also Google knows what your maplet is so that if we find it really useful, it can be featured. And also, so for example, there we go, get a whole list of useful things that you might use if you were going to Chicago or lived in Chicago. So it's really important that your maplet is well described so that people can actually find it. Another thing you can actually do is have an external link so that people can add your maplet without having to go through and search for it themselves. For example, if you're running a blog or on your website and you think this is a great tool that people will use on Google Maps, then you can actually just give them this URL which will take them straight to Google Maps and ask them to add your maplet so they can get going straight away with it. The other thing that's really important is to make your maplet topical and useful. So whenever um, there's a huge news story in the world, people with the get maplets out there, they get a lot of hits because people are using them for a specific purpose when they need them. If you try and make a wishy-washy maplet which doesn't really suit any single purpose well, then you're not gonna go very far. So for example, having your maplet specific to a city, like those Chicago ones is really useful because people who want to go to that city will use it, or having it suited to hotels, something that makes it useful for everyone. So the last thing is, where can you find out more about these maplets? So if you just go to code.google.com slash APIs, you'll get to this page. If you just go to the geo link, then they're right there and easy, easy to find. And in here you'll find lots of startup um, maplets, how to create them, stepping you through the processes, pitfalls, as well as a comprehensive reference which goes through all the objects and all the functions that you can call and what they do. So that's it for maplets. I've just got a few housekeeping notes and then any questions, please feel free to ask them. So the first thing is I've been asked to um, get you to fill out your feedback forms that are on your seat. And when you have, there's a bin at the back which contains them um, to have them. Lunch is going to be served from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. And there's, but there's no rush. Anytime you want to go up there, it's going to be open the whole time. And then you can either feel free to eat up there or if you want to bring your food back down. And also, if you haven't got your badge, can you please head to the registration desks by 2 p.m. Great. So does anyone have any questions? Sure. Yep. Can I get you to step up to the mic so that everyone can hear? I can do. Um, I have this will be actually published on YouTube, um, and then at that time there'll probably be a link to the slides. Yep. For the files that are stored in the cache, um, none that I've seen. You can't, we won't necessarily guarantee that they're cached all the time. For example, like if your maplet is always asking for, say, a different, a slightly different URL, so it's getting a unique hit every time, then they might actually be start to be removed from the cache before so that they won't be reused, but there's no um, documented restrictions on them, no. So it's actually failing, or is it just giving you an older copy?
Okay, well, um, if you like, I'll talk to you about that in a bit. Is that all right? Cool, no worries. No, um, so that was if maplets can be embedded in your own website rather than having to go to maps.google.com. So at this stage, they actually need to be embedded on the main website so that they can actually get the infrastructure they need around them. Like, for example, those little iframes, all that communication setup is required both servers to be working together. Um, but that would, gadgets themselves, just a plain old gadget, can be syndicated anywhere. Sorry. Yep. Hi. There's the GTOM overlay, yeah. There's also a ground overlay, which is instead of having a set of map tiles. So, sorry, the question was um, about G tile layer and custom maps. So, the G tile over G tile layer overlay object actually lets you specify your own set of map tiles, which use the same zoom in hierarchy as the Google Maps. So you can actually have custom maps. Um, on the other hand, you have the G ground overlay, which instead of actually having to implement a full set of tiles for the entire world, you just have a single ob um, image which takes a lot long bounds and is rendered onto the map at that point. Yeah, no, just these objects here that are the ones that are supported. So, if you actually look at the API documentation, you'll see that there's actually a much richer um, set of objects because there are a whole lot of extra things that you can do to change the way Maps operates. Whereas on Maplets, it's, again, we're trying to maintain standard behavior and keep it simple. So a lot of the more um, unique objects here aren't ported over to Maplets. Oh, sorry. The name of the city. Oh, right. Sorry. So, you want to do reverse geocoding, or there's the geocoder which takes the name of a city or um, an object like that, and then gives you back the lat longs for that area. But you want to take a lat long and get back the information. At the moment, that's not available through the Maplets API. Um, that's definitely something we'd consider, yeah. How do we clear the cache? How often, or? OK. So the one thing I didn't mention is when you're actually making your Maplets, let me see if I can find the XML file that you specify for that maplet is actually cached in the same way as all the other files you get in through the cache. So as an end user, you don't really get to choose when you're going to flush that cache out because that's maintained and hidden behind. Um, if you have the developer maplet installed, this one here, then in the corner of, your, of every maplet that you load, there will be a reload button, which basically causes that maplet to be refreshed right from the server so you don't have to worry about caching issues. You, if Once you start developing maplets, you'll find this to be the most essential tool you use because if you make a single typo and you upload the file, without this, you won't be able to get the correction. But with this, it'll get, you'll get the latest version of the file. Yep. Um, in my original example, no, that was just four different maplets working together. So, yeah, sure. So, the question is how you can combine maplets. So, maplets actually, by nature, allow themselves to be combined with other maplets. So, when before we were looking at the directory, we added all those maplets. Here is the list of maplets that I've got 
currently loaded into my maps. So I've got Chicago spot crime, Chicago transit map, the Google real estate search. So while ever they're still checked on the side here, they'll actually be loaded and active in the map. No. So each maplet actually can coexist with, it, with other maplets and even coexist with itself. So you can have more than one thing on the map at once. Can you have a maplet turn off other maplets? No, you shouldn't be able to. If you can, we'd like to know why. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, usually you'd want your maplet to sort of stay out of the way. So you don't want a maplet, for example, that every time you zoom, it zooms you back to where you were to start off with. Because users are quickly going to find that frustrating and they're going to turn that maplet off permanently. Yep. Well, um, that's really up to the user because you can't ha say my maplet is better than your maplet or more important than your maplet necessarily. And users might want sometimes just to have one maplet running, but other times they might have a general utility maplet, say, that, um, load, that has information that they always want to see on the map. And no matter what other maplet they use, they want that maplet loaded. So yeah, each maplet is separated as well as we can from every other maplet so that users at the end have the control. Yep. No, you shouldn't. Well, not at the moment. You can't. Um, just make them one maplet, really. You could always um, have them talk to each other via your server or via cookies. Um, but that's really going to be much more, have much more latency than fi simply finding another maplet. At the moment, they all run on the mapsgmodules.com domain. So you could actually go and look for other iframes and try and talk that way. But there's no guarantee that we won't change the domains in the future. So they, yeah, you really shouldn't be able to talk to each other with JavaScript. Yep. All right. Right, yeah. So the question's about whether you can run maplets in a private server without actually accessing the external internet. Inter internet? No, at the moment, definitely not, because it basically needs all the infrastructure of maps.google.com to run. Yeah. Sorry, one last question was there? Yep. And to actually load, um, sorry, a file on the sitting on the. Right, so can a maplet load a local file? No, it can't. In the same way that a normal JavaScript can't load that. The only option would be to have a file upload box that lets the user choose that file and then upload it back to your server so that then you could interact with it in the same way as any other JavaScript. Okay? Great. Well, I think we're out of time, but. Thank you very much for your attention.